Galatians 2, turn to, um, turn to Acts, turn to Acts chapter 5. We'll start out in Galatians 2, but I want you in Acts 5, because that's where we're going in a couple of minutes. Something occurred to me, and I was going back over my notes for this morning, um, about false brethren. There's something that tie all these examples that I'm giving you out of Scripture, there's something that occurred to me that ties them together. And it's really right there in the Scripture. It's right under your nose. Um, and I'll tell you what it is in a minute. But when Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and he said the truth, not a truth, not one for this age, one for the next age, the truth. There's one source of truth. He said, when you know the truth, it will make you you free and I like being honest one of the hardest things in the world to do when we grew up out of childhood and became adults and adulthood hit us one of the hardest things for a person to do is become honest with themselves okay we spent all our childhood lying through childhood to get out of trouble and I can remember the first first lie our oldest daughter Lindsay I remember what she said almost but it was to get out of trouble we asked her did you do this and she we knew when you only have one child (laughs) yeah Um, but we knew we knew that she did it and we asked her and she said no she lied and, you know, God made me think about that for a while. Mike, where'd she learn that? Oh, I didn't teach it to her. I didn't explain to her, this is how you get out of trouble. It's instinctive. It's in our, it's in our sin nature. Adam and Eve's first response to their sin was cover it up, bury it. Cover it up. Don't deal with it. So that's what they attempted to do. And, um, and I'll explain that as we go through this. Galatians 2, that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. And I went through the last few Sundays showing you false brethren connected to false doctrines, false prophets, false teachers, false Bibles, everything false. And tonight, uh, during the study hour tonight, we're going to take a look at, we're going to have a brief look at Satan, who he is, what he does, what he's capable of, what he's not capable of. We'll, st- we'll kind of, that's going into Genesis 3 tonight, and we'll look at that because he ties into this. He is the father of all lies. If ever a lie is told, he came up with it. And we have examples of that all through the scripture. But anyway, when, when I went looking for examples of false brethren... Uh, We have Demas, who I spoke about last Sunday and talked a little bit about him, his situation, how he started, uh, but that he has forsaken Paul, having loved this present world, and he's departed in Thessalonica. The Bible says, love not the world. So then we have the next example, which is Acts chapter 5. And my wife bought me glucose tablets, so I don't have to bum candy from Gloria this morning in case I need it. But it's uh, Acts chapter 5, and you're going you're gonna to see then how this man and his wife treated God. You're going to see how they treated God and how they treated the truth. Okay? Uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Now... Um, let's get a little back up here. Um, I read something um, the other day in the book of Proverbs. If you're in Acts chapter 5, look at the last few verses of chapter 4. Um, if you look at that, verse 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold laid them down at the apostles' feet, and and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. 
Now, this was not mandatory. There was The apostles at no time ever told the church people, this is what you have to do. Jim Jones, Jim Jones did that. The Catholic priest does that. Tell, this still goes on to this day. I've had people tell me, um, the Catholic priest will go to these widows' families or widower families and tell them, he's in purgatory, you need to bail him out, and it's going to cost you such and such and such and such. Hand it over. And they'll do it. They'll do it every time. Guy told me that a Catholic priest went to this man's brothers. And, uh, or this man's sons. This man died. Priest went to all the sons and said, everybody give over a portion so we can get him out of purgatory. And one of the sons cursed him and said, let the, you know what, rot where he is. I ain't paying you a dime. Okay? But it's a shakedown is all it is. It's a shakedown for money. But at no time did the apostles ever demand that anybody sell anything and hand it over. People will use this portion of scripture, this little story, as a basis for communism or communalism or communitarianism or community or any kind of thing like that. And I'm a firm believer the Bible teaches explicitly against communism and socialism. And I'll tell you why. Socialism and communism, let's put it in the application of Christianity. The community says, and communism says, if one benefits, the community must all benefit equally. Everybody must be equal. Equality. When you hear these people on TV all the time talking about equality, that's part of it. If one benefits, it is mandatory that everybody must benefit equally, whether they merited it or not. Mandatory. Now, salvation and God's blessings to us are not mandated by some law that he has to give us anything. He does it simply by his love and his mercy for us. But there's no law that says God has to. It is by his mercy he saves us. And so in Christianity, it would be the idea that if one of us are blessed, we must all get a blessing simultaneous and equal. Everybody must share. Everybody must be equal. There can be nobody who has one penny more than anybody else. Okay? Some guys, I, there, was a, there was a story that this tech firm out in... Silicon Valley, this guy made billions, decided to pay everybody in his company the equal pay. Everybody's getting 80 grand a year, including all of his top research scientists who took a cut in pay, lost all their bonuses to get paid the same money as the janitor got, and they quit him. They said, we got PhDs. We spent our life learning this to make you this money. And we're not, and you know, I like the janitor, he's a good guy, but he does not do our work. So that does, it doesn't work. And it wasn't mandatory in the early church. And I was sitting at the doctor's office the other day. I, boy, I'm liking these doctor visits because I get, and I just, since you got to wait, got to read the Bible. So I'm reading Proverbs, and I sent this to Reg Kelly. Proverbs chapter 1. In fact, you got to turn there. I'm just giving you a little background here. This is where my mind is today. I'm all over the place. Proverbs chapter 1. I'll show you this. I'll show you communism. Communism is Proverbs 1 verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us work privily for the innocent without cause. Show me a communist revolution with no bloodshed. They killed millions of their own people to enforce communism. Uh, let us, verse 12, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. 
Look at verse 14. Cast in thy lot among us and let us all have one purse. That's communism. That's communism. We're all going to share out of the same purse. And I sent those verses to Reg Kelly and he said, I said, this communism, he said, exactly. He knew exactly what I was talking about. In the parable of the um, ten virgins, the five wise and five foolish, the five foolish had, had lamps, no oil. They would not read and believe the scriptures. Those who were ready did. When it came time, those who were not ready, the foolish ones said to the wives, give us of your oil. There was no commandment from the bridegroom to give away their oil. And they said, not so. Because if we give you, there won't be enough for you and us. There's not enough. And so the five that were wise went in. The five that were foolish, they were foolish. Okay? And right here, again, in Acts chapter 4, there is zero commandment from the apostles to sell everything you've got and let's all throw it in one pot. This was something that these people did as a free will gesture for what God had done for them. And they were glad to do it. So when Ananias and Sapphira shows up, I think it's important to remember there is no commandment here from the apostles to go sell everything you have, lay it down at the disciples' feet. They were not told to do this. So it makes you ask the question, why then did they do it? If they knew, see this is the, I got a little bit of lawyer in me. It makes you wonder what their motive was. So let me throw that out to you. They sold, they sold a property, kept back. Here, here, here you have all these people given by name. Jo, in verse 36, Joseph, Barnabas, um, and different others who are selling property, bringing all the money in. Why do you think Ananias and Sapphira wanted to sell the property, give part of the money away, and then lie the way they did? What do you think motivates that? Huh? They want people to notice what they did, the prestige of it. They want the attention. They want the eyes drawn to them. Look at what they did. I want you to look on the sides of these pews here. There are no plaques saying who donated for that pew. There's no, there's no plaque anywhere in this building that shows you who gives what or who, who donated for what cause or whatever. I don't, I just don't go for that. If you're going to give, give. If you don't have it, you don't have it. Okay? God blesses some people. God blesses others in a different way. But don't come, lay out a bunch of money, and then want the notification over it. Don't, don't expect your name in the paper with your picture. You handing this big check, you know, in the, in the paper, like the Lions Club or somebody. Don't think that that's Christianity because it's not. Anybody else got any other opinions on it? Okay. Yeah. You, it, you, it just kind of gives you the idea that these two just reeked of money anyway. And they liked, like Cubby said, they liked the prestige of he's one of these, some of these town people that like everybody to know their name in town. Okay, the banker, they're, they're known at the bank. When they walk in the bank, they know they can have their way. When they go into certain stores and certain places, they know they can get their way with everybody. And that's the kind of people I see these two as being. She's walking around this mink coat, okay, with a little poodle dog and stuff like that, okay? So anyway, again, there's no, there's no, there's no communitarianism here. There's nothing here except certain people offering up what God had blessed them with. They sold the property. They, I'm sure they weren't selling everything that they had and turning over to a life of mere poverty so that everybody, I, I'm sure it wasn't that way. They, they sold some property. I got property over here I don't need. God's blessed me. I'm going to give it to the church. I'll live my life. You live, you live yours. That's how I see this. 
So they sold a possession. Verse 2, kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it. And brought a certain part, Bible does not say how much, and laid it at the apostles' feet. It, the issue is not how much they gave. It, the Bible's not telling you how much they brought in, total price, what percentage of it went to the church. The Bible's not telling you any of that. Okay? This was a free will. They didn't have to do anything. They came in later. So, but Peter said, and the Holy Ghost is telling Peter, these people are lying through their teeth. Peter gets it. Peter said, and I, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Look at verse four. This is, this is what I've been saying. Verse four, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And something that communism and socialism despises is personal property. They despise the idea that you have a right to own personal property. They tell you this land is not your land. This land is not my land. It's our land altogether. No, it's not. You're a big fat liar. Okay. That's pretty good, wasn't it? Um, but that's what communism teaches teaches against when when the when the Bolsheviks took over Russia they confiscated every factory and every acre of land confiscated every farm took it they didn't ask for it they didn't buy it they took it and people and you either gave it or your blood was shed on your own land then they took it over it now belongs to the state the state then tells the farmer, you farm so much, you give us the crop, we'll pay you a monthly wage. And Brother Kelly went to Russia a few years ago, came back, told me this. He said, Mike, it was back in Soviet, he said it was a mess. He said, you had guys just sitting around all day, farmers. And Reg is a farmer, he knows the work. And he said, you got guys just sitting around all today and you ask them, why don't you work? And we say, as long as the government pretends to pay us, we pretend to work. Okay, meaning they weren't getting much. So they didn't feel like they had worked much. Okay, so what do you, what's your motivation then to produce? You've got 500 acres of ground. Why should you work 500 acres of ground only to give all of it away? For somebody else why would you do that while you live in near poverty because everybody knows you go into communist countries the stores are empty there's nothing there okay I had I don't, I'm just talking out of my head today I had a dream about giving a speech in North Korea and I was getting arrested for it okay I've watched documentaries about North Korea on YouTube, and there's nothing there. I mean, it is a total dictatorship, and the Kim family owns it all. Every acre of it. They own every grain of rice in that country, and they steal. They got people going around all over the world doing banking for the Kim family. They're stealing money everywhere. That goes on a lot here too, by the way. But anyway, so verse 4, Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? God gave Israel property. He gave them land. He gave each tribe a portion, an inheritance. And did you know that not every tribe got the same amount of land? It was God who gave it to them. God is the one who portioned it out. God is the one who said, Levi gets this, Judah gets this. Issachar gets this, Naphtali gets this, Gad gets this over here. It was God who said that. And it's still the same way now. Some people get gifts. Some may get more than others. Some may need more than others. Some people need more grace than other people. Okay? Some people do. But also, to, wh to whom much is given, much is required. Okay? But whilst it remained, was it not thine own? Ananias, you could have done whatever you wanted to do with this. You could have turned around and walked away. Thou hast not lied unto men. Oh, excuse me, I skipped something. And after it was sold, 
Was it not in thine own power? Yes, to both of these. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And there it is right there. False brethren are liars. And let's reverse that. Liars, if someone exhibits a pattern of lies in their life, that tells me something about their salvation. A pattern of lies. Okay, now, nobody here is above it. Let God be true and every man a liar. We've got it in us. Okay, and sometimes maybe God's got to break us down a little bit to get the truth out of us, but eventually tell the truth. Okay, and that's all Ananias had to do. All, that's all he had to do, but that's not what he wanted. He wanted, like Cubby said, he wanted the prestige of selling that property to get the notoriety that he saw other people getting. It made him look good at the civic club meeting or whatever it was. So verse 5, and Ananias hearing these words fell down. Um, do your own study of things that fall in the Bible. Things that fall. Lucifer falls. Dagon fell. Babylon falls. Jericho fell. fell. Um, Ananias falls. Things that fall. People that fall away. Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. See, this was... God allowed this situation to take place. God could have smote Ananias' heart, said, before Ananias ever showed up with the money, Ananias, you're not doing right. I've had that happen before. God smite me, Mike, you're not doing right. Mike, you're not doing right. I'll whoop the fire out of you. Okay? God could have, but didn't. He wanted this to happen to instill fear in his believers' hearts. I'm still God. I'm still the judge of all men's deeds and their motives. Blessed are the pure in heart, and Ananias was not. So great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose and wound him up, carried him out and buried him. I mean, right then, wrapped him in potato cloth or potato sack cloth or whatever, wrapped him up, dug a hole, stuck him in there. Verse 7, and it was about the space of three hours after. That's about a good afternoon shopping trip, wouldn't you say? She's got a pocket full of money now, does she not? Her and her fur coat and her little poodle dog. When his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Peter answered unto her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. Gave her a chance. And she said, yeah, for so much. He gave her a chance. She could have separated herself. Hey, listen, people, there's a, there's a story in this. You don't have to be involved in your own family's sins. You don't have to go down with them. If your wife's not going to do right, do right. If your husband's not going to do right, do right. If your family, your children don't do right, if your mom and dad don't do right, you do right. She didn't have, God gave her a chance. Peter gave her a chance. Gave her a chance to do right. But see, you've got people here that to me... I just don't see salvation here. I don't see it. And the Bible doesn't tell you that they were listed among the brethren. It doesn't tell you that. So, verse 9, Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt 
the Spirit of the Lord. Um, what did Satan do? Here's Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus, the Bible says, if you'll jump down off this cliff here, God will send his angels down to pick thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Why don't you go ahead and jump? That's tempting God. Falling, tripping is one thing. If you jump, you're on your own. Okay? You want to handle snakes in your church service? Be my guest. Where's the back door? And if you don't have one, where do you want one? Because I'm going to make one. I'm not staying there. Okay? But she tempted the Spirit of the Lord. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I have seen statements from ridiculous people who claim that they can literally do anything they want now that they're saved and nothing. They can take the mark of the beast. They can do anything. And I'm going, you people are nuts. You have no fear of the Lord. She fell down straight away at his feet and yielded up the ghost. I, I missed part of it. How has you agreed to te together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband or at the door shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead. And these guys are going, another one? By the time they buried her, they're coming back and they're going, are we good? Okay. Is anybody else, Peter? Um, they buried her by her husband. Great fear, verse 11. Great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. This story is recorded in your Bible for a reason. It's to tell you, don't tempt the Lord. Don't provoke Him. Don't, and here it is, don't lie to God. It's ridiculous anyway. Because he already knows. And it doesn't do you any good. It's not like God's going to say, well, maybe you're right. I'll let you go this time. Don't lie to God. When David was confronted with, when Satan provoked David to number the armies of Israel, God told him not to do it. And we think it's probably because... God is the one who always gave David the victory. It wasn't how many men he had in his army. He proved that with Gideon. So he tells David, don't number your army. David is provoked by Satan to number his armies. And God then sends the prophet to him and says, David, I want to make a deal with you. You got one of two things. I can put you into the hands of men and let them deal with you. Or you can come to me and let me deal with you. David was wise. And he said, men, I don't trust. But I will trust God. And God chastised David. But he blessed him afterward. He forgave him. Same with the deal with Bathsheba. He chastised him. The sword never left his house. His house fell apart after that. But God blessed him. David's in heaven. Okay? Great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. These things are written for us for examples. Um, turn to 1 Samuel 10. And while you do that, I'll read to you 1 Corinthians 10. You turn 1 Samuel 10, 1 Corinthians 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them was God not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they did, neither be idolaters as were some of them. As it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. Uh, I think part of Ananias and Sapphira was lust, greed. The love of money, is it not the root of all evil? And that's something we've missed out of that story. The love of money. 
So I think it probably had more to do than just the prestige, the love of money. Okay? And so, but these things are written to us as examples of what not to do because this is how God's going to deal with it. And if you've got it embedded in your mind that somehow God's a different God to you than he is to everybody else in the Bible, then there's no help for you. 1 Samuel chapter 10. This is about Saul. I'm going to show you a difference. 1 Samuel 10 verse 9. Uh, this is God telling Samuel, I'm going, to, I'm going to give Israel a king and I'm going to send you out to find him. And so Samuel goes out and he finds Saul is head and shoulders above everybody else. Very tall. He's noticeable. Okay, probably good looking man. So Samuel anoints Saul. And in verse 9, it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. When they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to... Here's Saul now preaching. He's preaching. So here's a question for you. Can you be a preacher and fall? So he prophesied among them. It came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that people... Behold, he prophesied among the prophets... Then the people said one to another, What is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? And I'm not sure why in verse 12, one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? I'm not sure why it says that. But when I look at that, it makes me think of what God said to David. Concerning Saul, later on, he tells David, David's now king, David wants to build the temple, God won't let him. He said, you're a man of war, I'm going to let your son do it. And he said, your son will be my son, and I will be his father. And I think this is what matters here. When they ask, but who is their father? It is obvious that God was never Saul's father. Never. Is Saul also among the prophets? So he starts out at the beginning when, when he f is first anointed. Saul's a, he's prophesying, he's preaching. He's given out the word of the Lord. Is it possible that such a man could through the corruption of time, fall away. Answers in 1 Samuel 15. Let's examine, five, just five chapters later. I've used this example many times, but it always stuck out in my mind. When, if you look back years and years ago at Billy Graham, and his preaching in days gone by, it was beyond reproach. But then later on, adding to his crusades, Roman Catholic confessionals. So that his crusades, when he has an altar call and people come down, they have people down there asking them, are you Roman Catholic? If they say yes, they don't let them go to where all the Protestants are going to ask for Jesus. They send them to the confessional where they have priests standing by. This is known and done. I think of Jerry Falwell, who in years gone by was beyond reproach in his preaching, his life. But then he comes out September 12, 2001, says this is God's judgment upon America for killing our babies and for homosexuality and for fornication and abortion and everything else. And then five days later comes out and apologizes for saying that. And his son now has taken over that... Uh, church and it's a mess no more King James they fall well later endorsed the new King James his son has endorsed all these new translations they're not the same as they used to be the corruption of time took place and that's something that's always been sitting in my mind in my heart Mike study these guys 
and how they turned out. Not how they started, how they turned out. And that scares me. So 1 Samuel 15, verse 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. God told you that. Wherefore then... Didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil? And here's another example. What was Saul's motivation, David? Greed. He saw the cattle, the gold, the merchandise of the Amalekites. Babylon took over. Babylon is a merchandising spirit. It makes the things of God for sale. And it draws people in with greed, temptations of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, the comforts. Let's have expensive things. Let's, have, let's let God prosper us. And it becomes all about money and nothing else. So he flew upon the spoil. Uh, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. He didn't tell him to go take what he wanted. He told him to destroy it. You go do what God tells you to do. God will fill your pockets. He'll fill your own. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey. See, because Saul used the excuse, I did it for God. And he said, I got the king here. God told him to kill the king. And he said, all that sheep the people took. He's lying through his teeth. God knows it. God told it to Samuel the night before. Samuel's grieving. Samuel sat and bawled all night over Saul. He did. Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, which is the truth. He hath also rejected thee from being king. Saul lied through his teeth, as did Ananias and Sapphira. Liars. When confronted about their sin they lied they lied to God they lied Saul and see lying about your sin is robbing God in this way it is self justification it is either you thinking you did something and you had a right to do it now, you know not, a, not everybody else is going to see it that way, so you're going to lie to them anyway. But you believe that you, or you tell yourself you had a right to do it, or you, what you did wasn't wrong, or wasn't that wrong, or any number of lies we tell ourselves. But the lies to God about the sin is self-justification. And it robs God of the blessing of him taking your sins away through the cross versus you trying to cover up your own sin your own way, usually by lying. So 1 Samuel 16, 14, we have it very plainly written. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. It's been replaced. And how did, I mean, here we have in, in 1 Samuel 10, we have Saul preaching. And by 1 Samuel 16, we have the Spirit of the Lord departing from Saul. And then, I um, can't remember exactly what chapter it's in, where he ends up going to the witch of Endor. He ends up, when Samuel said rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, that is exactly where Saul ended up. 
That's what religion then he converted over to. Whether he did it willingly or not, that's what he was turned over to. God turned him over to a reprobate mind. Saul could have confessed, refused to confess. So, 1 Chronicles 10, 13. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord. Even against the word of the, the word of the Lord is your Bible, which he kept not. And also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. It's witchcraft, necromancy, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him and turned again the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. And so my brothers and sisters, and uh, I don't have time to bell ring. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. There's nothing that says you have to tell all of your deepest, darkest, worst sins in the world to somebody else in this world. There's nothing that says that. But you don't lie to God. And people, when people ask you, you can just say, look, I'd rather not talk about that. I don't want to talk about it. I've confessed my sin. God says it's over with. I want to move on. Nothing wrong with that. And there may be consequences. There always is. There's always scars. It's always a correction. But God's rod is far more favorable than the scorches of hell. Far more. Father in heaven, open up our eyes. Open up our hearts. Help us to see, God, what we're doing, what we've been involved in, what we lied about. Father, help us to be truthful in our inward parts. Help us, dear God, at all times to be open and honest with you and lie not to you. God, I pray that you would chastise us, chastise me, deal with me as a son. Be angry with me for a moment. And then, Father, I'll need your loving kindness. Father, don't let us get away with anything. Our hearts are wicked. And we're full of lust and greed and filthiness. And our flesh draws us away. But God, help us to be honest with you at all times. Yielding to our loving Savior our merciful God, not being afraid of the chastisement of peace that will be upon us. Father, we just love you and we thank you, God, for dealing with us as your children, as your sons, and not casting us away. Help us, dear God, force us, dear God, to be honest with you in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.